Tonight on the final play. We've got to get better, and not just on defense. Like I said, you know, we've got to be better offensively. The Saints' home opener ends in defeat with plenty of room for improvement going forward. Every week it gets urgent and more urgent because the Saints right now are the only winless team in the NFC South. We're making sense of the Saints' September woes, and the spotlight is shining bright on Kenny Vaccaro. And I don't know why I got pulled out of the game. I mean, I, I, don't, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't understand. Plus, a topsy-turvy weekend of college football in South Louisiana and some dazzling highlights from high school action. From Fox 8 Sports, this is the final play. Sponsored by your Southern Quality Ford dealer, built for tough. And Nissan. Welcome into the final play. I'm Juan Kincaid, and for the fourth straight season, the Saints have fallen into an 0-2 hole. In fact, if the NFL season could start in October, the Saints might have a puncher's chance of getting a win because they haven't won in September since 2014. Nine straight losses. Sean Mazan has more on today's 36-20 loss to the Patriots. The Saints and Patriots met inside the Mercedes-Benz Superdome, both determined to avoid that dreaded 0-2 hole. And one team was able to capitalize on that sense of urgency. And unfortunately, that team was not the Saints. Obviously, um, that's a difficult loss. There are not going to be a lot of things, you know, that we like when we watch this tape. And it all started with number 12. In week one against the Chiefs, Tom Brady looked like an aging 40-year-old quarterback. Today against the Saints, he looked like, well, the greatest quarterback of all time. He absolutely shredded the Saints defense and finished 30 of 39 for 447 yards and three touchdowns. The ball comes out quick with Tom. I mean, and it has... Week to week when you watch him play, there's a, there's a rhythm to his game. Ultimately, you have to disrupt the passing game, either pressuring the quarterback or, you know, bumping at the line of scrimmage. Neither happened. Like last week, they had coverage breakdowns in the secondary. They lacked any real pass rush, and even when they did make plays, like interceptions on back-to-back -back plays in the third quarter, both were called back for penalties. The first was the most confusing as the 12 men on the field call negated a huge interception in return from rookie Marcus Williams. It's a classic Tom where, you know, he, he there's a, a quick substitution being made and I, I haven't seen the replay or how close uh, Manti was to getting off. Obviously, it's frustrating when it's a turnover. With Brady on fire, the Saints offense knew they had to keep up and at times they did. But familiar problems plagued them. Like third down, the Saints were only able to convert four of 12. We knew, we knew the offense we were, we were going to be trading punches with on the other side, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, unfortunately, they were just, they were more efficient than we were. They even went forward on fourth down late in the second quarter, down 14 instead of kicking the field goal. Drew Brees just missed Ted Ginn Jr. in the end zone. With regards to, to the way that half had started out, you know, we felt pretty good about a play. Um, you know, we just weren't able to connect on it. Uh, but I think a lot of it's pulse of the game. I don't know that I normally would do that. A lot of it's just how this game was going. Breeze was battling behind an uncommon offensive line. With Teron Armstead and Zach Street both out, the Saints shifted Ryan Ramshek to right tackle, started Andrews Pete at left tackle, and had Sinio Calamete playing left guard. Uh, we felt like this was, look, if it was just a week, if it was just a week, it might be a little different. But, you know, looking at the time frame that we're operating on, we felt like this was, uh, you know, the best decision for us moving forward. Still, it wasn't nearly enough. And now the Saints find themselves 0-2 for the fourth year in a row. Once again, trying to dig themselves out of an early season hole. Obviously, uh, you start off like this and, and there's disappointment. And, and yet, you know, we've got the right type of locker room. But we're going to have to respond quickly. We play Carolina and then, you know, go on the road uh, for another week. So, you know, we'll find out a little bit about what we're made of. We only have, we only have one way to go, and that's up, <laughs> right? Um, and we go on the road in the division um, against a very good Carolina team. So there's not much time to, um, you know, dwell on anything other than making the corrections that need to be made. And... Uh, focusing on a great game plan. We're now joined by the voice of the Saints, Jim Henderson. And Jim, another Sunday in September. We pretty much know the result. 1-11 in 11 since 2014 in September games. Another early season hole. And you just kind of feel the funk settling in over this organization, over this fan base, over this city. Another tough one. 
I think you're right, and thanks for that report, and I'm out of here. Because <laughs> no. it's, it's so discouraging. Yeah. You know, it's not like it's one side of the ball. Like, this is two games in a row. The offense has been bad. The defense has been bad. Even Thomas Morstead didn't punt as well mm. as he did in the first game. So it's extremely discouraging. It's not like there's one hole in the dike to put your finger mm -hmm. in. Uh, there's a 20 of them. We've seen slow starts before, but last year, for instance, it was a close game against Oakland to start the season. Uh, and then it was a close loss to New York up in New York. These are two double-digit losses where the final score did, was not indicative of how lopsided the game was. Mm -hmm. Jim, we may have a real problem here. I mean, it's, this is, they're not even competitive right now. No, and it's the same problems in both games. I mean, you can't run the ball, apart from the last run by Mark mm -hmm. Ingram that'll skew things. Mm -hmm. You can't run the ball. Uh, you can't convert on third down. You can't stop third down conversions. You can't rush the passer. You got one sack. You can't force turnovers. Mm -hmm. Didn't uh, this? We saw this. I mean, we've been seeing this for years. They didn't even get their hands on the ball <laughs> defensively to force a turnover you know no fumble recoveries no interceptions so if you can't cover real well a pass rush will help they don't get it if you can cover well that'll help your pass rush they can't cover now uh, they've got people being benched in their secondary there there are receivers running free and this is a vastly defeated deflated Patri uh, patriot team and look at how well they did without some of their mainstays well, they still have Tom Brady, and old number 12 looked like a, uh, a guy that was pretty angry, and that spelled bad news for the Saints. He came out smoking. He was on fire, and he absolutely shredded the Saints defense that was probably primed to be shredded. Uh, old number 12 looked pretty good. Yeah, he did. I mean, getting ready for this game, you read reports out of New England, and people are hinting about the fact that this could be it for him. He's 40 mm -hmm. years old, and this is not Tom Brady who was harassed in the pocket very much until late in the game against the Chiefs. This is a guy who's lost his accuracy, who's missing wide open receivers who what completed like 42 percent of his passes but worst in his history this is a guy that maybe is on the cusp of of really losing it didn't look that way today did he <laughs> sure did not he looked like basically what he is which is the greatest quarterback uh, of all time he had uh, over 400 yards and by the end of the first half I'm not sure he even had to come back out because <laughs> it was pretty much over uh, at that point I want to get your thoughts real quick I'm going to talk about this later in the show Chris Hagan's going to have it but um Kenny Vaccaro getting benched did that uh, did that uh, raise your eyebrow a little bit yeah, a little bit. Uh, I think Sean's just ticked about it. You know, it's been, uh, as Chris would say, quite a, quite a week for, for Kenny Vaccaro, mm -hmm. the, the subject of trade rumors that the Saints really, even in postgame, didn't go out of their way to deny. Um, so those are going to run rampant. Last week, the story was Adrian Peterson's unhappiness. Well, I'm not sure how much happier he is today, but he did see the ball a little bit more. This week, the story is probably the unhappiness of Kenny Vaccaro, who's supposed to be one of your team leaders on defense, one of the most vocal guys, certainly, on the team in that way. And apparently, he's being shopped. And the question, kind of like when somebody said, well, uh, maybe you can work a trade for Adrian Peterson, what has he shown that would want other teams to want him? And what has Kenny Vaccaro shown through the first two games that want, want other teams to, to want him? What's his trade value right now? It's just a very discouraging situation. It really is. And in Peterson's case, there were a couple of times where he saw that outside that was open and he went to get to that corner and he, he just, just, just doesn't there. seem to have it. Um, speaking of the offense, um, it felt like, at least from Sean Payton's comments, that when we tried, excuse me, we, we tried to steer the conversation towards the defensive woes, he was quick to point out the offensive woes. It sounds like he's a little bit upset. They're able to move the ball, but they're not finishing these drives. Yeah, and that's his baby, you know. Mm -hmm. um, the defense has long time been a problem, but now the offense is, is getting down to their level, so I'm sure he's ticked off because that's his side of the ball and they're not doing anything. And lastly, we've given you all this negativity. They're 0-2. They've lost both games by double digits. I'm searching, Jim, searching, searching for some glimmer of hope. The only thing I could say is it is a young team. They're playing a lot of young players. Maybe at some point they gel and they play better. But right now, it's hard to find any silver lining right now. Well, Carolina didn't play all that well today against the Bills. Um, and Greg Olson broke his foot, their best receiver. You hate to see that because mm -hmm. he's as quality a guy as he no is as a player. But you go there and uh, you have a chance of upsetting those guys. I'm sure they'll go there as an underdog. But I hate to think about the fact that you're going to have to go all the way to London at 0-3. That's going to be a very long flight. So every week it gets urgent and more urgent because the Saints right now are the only winless team in the NFC South. Yeah, so they got to get better and they got to do it in a hurry or it could be a long season pretty soon. Jim, thank you. All right, Sean. And this is just the beginning of Jim Henderson's analysis of the black and gold. He heats up beginning tomorrow morning with his black and gold rewind at 8 on our 5 p.m. news here on Fox 8. Jim's award-winning commentary will be on deck. And we wrap up our Saints talk with a ton of questions from you, the viewer. On Jim Henderson's Black and Gold Review Show, you can submit questions via the final word feature on the Final Play app.
We're just getting started with our Saints recap tonight. Coming up, Chris Hagan ponders the future of safety Kenny Vaccaro and if his current form warrants the Saints keeping him around. And later, while it was a rough and tumble weekend for almost all of our local colleges, one team gave its fans a silver lining. We'll go around the booth when the final play continues. Different week, different sideline dispute between player and head coach. Last week it was Adrian Peterson and Sean Payton. Today, poor play from Kenny Vaccaro drew the ire of Payton, which will make the coming weeks interesting because the Saints were reportedly shopping Vaccaro last week. Here's Chris Hagan. Less than a week ago, it was safety Kenny Vaccaro that said he wanted the defensive backs to put in some work on the Saints off day after their lopsided loss to Minnesota. He's shown that type of leadership all throughout training camp in the preseason, but it's not enough to keep him on the field right now. I don't know. I don't know what happened. I don't know why I got pulled out of the game. I mean, I, didn't I, didn't, I, I didn't understand. Vaccaro spent most of the second half on the sideline and wasn't at all happy about it. Asked why, Coach Payton says the reason isn't isolated to just this game. You know, we need to get more consistent play. Um, that dates back to last weekend, so we're going we're gonna to play those guys. Obviously, i got to be better. Um, my preparation, um, got to be more consistent. Like I said, the, the game before, I had plays that I wanted to get back. That's going to happen, but um, at the same time, yeah, I didn't understand this game, what happened. I know Gronk had two catches on me, really great catches. That was, that was about it. That's all. <laughs> That's all that really happened. The next thing you know, I'm sitting next to Coach Payton. And how much longer will we even see that? A car on the Saints' sideline wearing black and gold. The trade reports around the fifth-year safety keep on coming, and Coach Payton didn't deny anything. It's not unusual this early in the season for teams to call about teams that have depth at running back like we might or depth at safety. Nothing surprises me. I mean, anytime a GM gets a call, like, they're going to ask him, what, what, what are you willing to give? I mean, there's no, no player is um, ins indispensable except for quarterbacks and s certain players across this league. So I understand it's a business. Um, it doesn't bother me. At least on paper, it looks like the Saints' defense improved once Vaccaro left the game. They held New England out of the end zone in the second half, but playing with the three-score advantage for most of the third and fourth quarters, the Patriots certainly weren't hurting for points. The Saints' defense will have to improve as a whole if there's any chance at turning this season around. Reporting in the Dome, I'm Chris Hagan for the final play. Thanks a lot, Chris. Also, plenty of fantasy football coverage from him on our Final Play app and online. Every week, Chris gives out advice on the stars to sit and waiver wire pickups to make. Check out The Extra Point on the Final Play app and fox8live.com. It won't get any easier for the Saints next week as they hit the road to Charlotte to face the Carolina Panthers. The Panthers ran their record to 2-0 today after beating the Bills 9-3. The leg of Graham Gano was all the Panthers needed on the day that Cam Newton struggled to get the offense into the end zone. Also, the Panthers have a problem with the Saints coming into town next week. Tight end Greg Olson said he felt the pop while running. And after an x-ray, Olson confirmed he has a broken bone in his foot. Yeah, it was tough. I broke my foot. Um, pretty straightforward. X-ray was pretty conclusive. You know, it's just, just tough, you know, for something like that to just happen. I've been very lucky in my career to not get injured a lot. Um, so this is going to be something, obviously, that'll take a little time, but sometimes that's just part of the game. But we're 2-0. and oh. <laughs> I'm, I'm disappointed in myself, but, you know, happy for the overall team, you know, just to, just to see, you know, how we battle and, and, and f found ways to win the football game today. Uh, it wasn't pretty at all, but yet, you know, this this whole thing is about the process and trusting it. Uh, coach spoke on it, um, and you know, anytime in this in this league that you can get a, a win, you know, you take it and you run with it. So, you know, we're not going to apologize for that. You know, we I just have to know as a player, and 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 you know, personal challenges to myself that I have to be better, and I will be better. Football on Fox 8 is in full swing tomorrow night the Jim Henderson Black and Gold Review Show. Thursday is full steam ahead on the Panthers. Friday, we take a breather for high school football. And then Sunday, the game day routine. Tailgate in the Dome at 10 a.m. Recap and reaction Sunday night on the final play.
Coming up, we head to campus and pose the question, what's wrong with the LSU Tigers? They got humbled in Starkville on Saturday. And it wasn't much better for Tulane as they visited second-ranked Oklahoma. A look back when we come back. You're watching the final play. The quote of the night from Ed Ogeron's press conference following his Tigers' historic 37-7 loss to Mississippi State quote, maybe we aren't as good as we thought we were in spots, unquote. And those spots were all over the field as the Tigers looked lost in Starkville last night. They couldn't put together drives on offense, and their defense couldn't stop the Bulldogs from driving, especially Nick Fitzgerald's execution of the option. LSU played like it didn't know the Bulldogs would use it. The 30-point win for the Bulldogs, their largest margin of victory in this series, 111 meetings, and they just dominated the Tigers in every phase. Obviously, we're very disappointed in our play tonight. Uh, give the credit to Mississippi State. They played well, especially on the offense and defensive lines. Uh, they had 285 yards rushing on our defense. Uh, we could not stop the option, could not stop the inside run, gave up too many deep balls. Very disappointed in the nine penalties again. Uh, we're going to have to get better, get more discipline. This was an embarrassing loss. Don't get me wrong. And me as a leader, I'm going to go in the team room. And I, I'm a tell the I'm embarrassed. I'm embarrassed. Uh, I felt like we never quit, but uh, I'm embarrassed by, you know, the lack of discipline that we had out there as a unit. And, uh, you know, it starts with myself. And um, um, I'm more mad and I'm more ready to go and I'm ready for next week. I got in the locker room and I told him, you know, I was embarrassed as well because, I mean, just as far as the defense, you know, we gave up 30 some points. And that loss has nearly dropped the Tigers out of the top 25. More on that in a second. The top six have Alabama still number one, followed by Clemson, Oklahoma, Penn State, Southern Cal, and Oklahoma State. There are six SEC teams ranked behind Alabama, of course. Five of them, 11 through 25. Georgia's 3-0 and and up to number 11. Auburn's 15th. Mississippi State jumps into the poll after beating LSU and lands at 17. The Florida Gators move up to 20th. South Florida, by the way, the only American conference team in the top 25. They're at number 21. And there are the Tigers dropping 13 spots to number 25. <sighs> Tulane didn't have any better luck than LSU, nor were they supposed to, considering their opponent. The Greenies fought the good fight at second-ranked Oklahoma, and they were playing without their starting quarterback, Jonathan Banks, who got hurt a week ago at Navy. The Greenies actually led this game for a brief moment in the first quarter after touchdowns from quarterback Jonathan Brantley and running back Dontrell Hilliard. They led 14-7. But the Sooners scored 49 unanswered points to win 56-14. Well, you know, I, I think this could be a game that, you know, in, in six, seven weeks can kind of help you out a little bit when you're, you know, playing a, a quality opponent. And, and uh, you just got to keep battling and keep fighting. And, and uh, you know, I, I thought we did a very good job of that in the first half. You know, but, you know, there, there's ebbs and flows in the game. And when things are, are going your, in a positive direction for you, you just got to keep playing and keep fighting. And, uh, you know, that's one, one of the things we're, we're teaching our guys. We've got a lot of guys that battle throughout the ball game. I, I'm very impressed. I'm confident. Like, we're gonna, our team going to be fine. So it's, it's going to be confident. Everything's going to be the same. Nothing changed change with us. We're just going to come back out, execute the play, watch this film, take good evaluation of what we did, and use it for next week. The only winner from the boot on Saturday, Nichols State, as they took care of business against Prairie View, 44-14. And the Southeastern Lions could not get anything going on the road at Central Arkansas. They lost that game 38-6. The Lions are 0-3. As for the Colonels, it's nice to bounce back after a slim defeat at Texas A&M last week. Just proud of the way the guys came out because, uh, you know, obviously a tough loss last week. Uh, we didn't have any hangover from it. I thought our guys really practiced hard and prepared well. Uh, this week for it. We knew Prairie View had an excellent football team, can score some points. Uh, I thought defensively we did a good job of, of keeping them off the scoreboard. And our official Frank Wilson watch takes us to Texas San Antonio, and Wilson's team can't stop winning. Their latest victim, the Southern Jaguars, the Roadrunners, beep beep, out to a second quarter 48 0 lead and never looked back. UTSA is now 2 0 following their 51 17 win over the Jags. Southern falls to 1 and two. Still to come on the final play, week three of the prep football season is in the books. We'll take a look back at one of the biggest matchups and just how bad would LSU love to have Puka on their roster next season. We'll discuss the Hondo running backs options when the final play continues.
watching the final play. We're going to get to high school football in a second, but we want to show you what it takes to make it to the NFL. Making catches like this, courtesy of Brandon Coleman, it's our final play catch of the week. As for the Prepsters, our top play takes us back to the Easton Landry Walker game. Eagles trying to spark a comeback, and Damian Tate Jr. does just that. The interception, the celebration, all the way to the end zone to regain the lead, and Easton would hold on for the victory, 14-12 as your final. And one of the best games of the weekend took place over at Joe Yenny Stadium. Rummel and Riverside picked this up scoreless in the first quarter. Raiders' Chandler Fields finds a wide-open Coy Moore. 20-yard touchdown, the Raiders up 7-0. But Fields gets back to the air once again. He's pretty good. Quick hitter to Moore. 13 yards, pay dirt, Rummel, 14-0 early lead. Riverside also possesses a dynamic offense led by Jeremy Gibson, the 20-yard touchdown run up the middle, cuts Rummel's lead to 14-7. But this Rummel offense, goodness, it is so good. Dwayne Trufant bowls over a Riverside Rebel into the end zone from six yards out. 21-7 Raiders, they win it. Hang on, 38-34, they remain undefeated on the season. You can relive the whole high school weekend with highlights and scores on the Fox 8 News app or fox8live.com. Plus, you can catch up on the latest recruiting news, check out our weekly power rankings, and preview the next week's action. And there are so many players in southeast Louisiana that have what it takes to make it to the Division I level. One of them is all everything running back Anthony Puka Williams, who's been a beast for the Hanville Tigers this season. LSU's already offered him, and Williams is the kind of do-everything running back that would fit in well in the Tigers' system. A lot of the things Puka can do, Clyde Edwards can do, but uh, Puka's got that top-end speed. You know, Clyde Edwards is real short burst, great short area quickness guy. Has a pretty good top gear, but not elite level speed. Puka has elite level speed. I was with him uh, last year, saw him run. He ran the fastest time ever recorded on a Jordan track mat. 4.27 was the electronic time. So, I mean, this kid has that type of speed. I think they could find ways to use them uh, in multiple sets. You could put one in, in, the, in the slot and, and use him on the jet sweeps with the other in the backfield. You've got two great receiving weapons. So I think it just gives them, uh, you know, more dynamic home run threats from the running back position. <laughs> And that's our show for tonight. For all of us here at Fox 8, I'm Juan Kincaid. I hope you'll join us again next Sunday night for the final play. From Fox 8 Sports, this has been the final play.